Um, next speaker is Dr. Rolf Dalsek from Norwegian Director of Health. He will talk about the uh, monitoring use of gene technology in Norway. Please, welcome. So, thank you. Um, I guess most, or at least some of you, are aware that uh, the Directorate of Health is uh, uh, the responsible authority when it comes to um, to uh, enforcing the, the gene technology regulations. And then especially on uh, the contained use of GMO. And our uh, work with this uh, encompasses both approving laboratories for use of GMOs and approving certain kinds of projects and also um, assessing all the notifications on the content use in Norway. And we also perform inspections of all these laboratories. And currently we have approximately 150 uh, approved laboratories in Norway. And I think about 115 of them deals with uh, the contained use of genetically modified microorganisms. And I'll stick to microorganisms today, so, uh, although you can imagine that also genetically modified plants can do a lot of harm in bioterror aspects. So, okay. But this will be a report on our experiences from uh, the inspections uh, and some reflections uh, on the team. Um, what we see when we uh, perform our inspections is that mostly everything is in, in good shape. Um, there is often a lack of uh, approvals, uh, lack of notification, um, but mostly this um, uh, what do you call it? deviations from the regulations are uh, within the same um, area or uh, environment. Um, so what we have used to do the last, I think, five, six years, is to ask the, um, uh, the um, responsible person from in, in the lab, if it uh, has uh, a total overview of what's going on in his lab, and of course he, he's confirming that. But we also ask them if there might be going on things that is not aware of. And the answer is almost always, of course, we can't detect that. And everyone has tried to improve his boss by doing something off, off the record. So this has actually led us to uh, conclude that in principle, it is possible to annotate, produce a GM terror agent. And uh, of course, this is in theory, and it's not uh, that e easy. So, I mean, you will obviously very soon detect the discrepancy between um, the efforts put into the work and uh, the expected results that are not coming out. Um, we also see that some of the uh, labs have uh, implemented um, a prohibition against working alone outside the normal working hours. And I mean, that was initially out of uh, biosafety reasons to protect workers in, in case of accidents and things like that. But it also seems to have an effect on the ability 
of loan workers to, to perform their uh, work. Um, so this is our next conclusion. We have over the years now uh, observed an increased consciousness on internal control and biosecurity. And we think this may tend to reduce the opportunity to perform those kind of projects. But anyway, should someone against these odds succeed in producing a, a GM terror agent? Uh, this will, of course, represent an extended challenge to the preparedness in, in case of an attack. Uh, for example, I mean, diagnosis, as we heard earlier, will become difficult and will lose time. And treatment may become less effective if there has been added uh, antibiotic resistant genes. So we think that as opposed to, uh, no, uh, we think that these GM agents must be considered to represent an increased risk in terms of consequences of an attack. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, I think that uh, the same infection control uh, preparedness as with conventional uh, bioterror agents uh, will have to apply to this. I mean, so far, there is no special uh, parts in, the, in the, these plants which are directed at, at uh, genetically modified organisms. So, making a GM bioterror agent, modifying microorganisms, uh, this requires good skills in gene technology and a comprehensive uh, um, competence in microbiology, in immunology, maybe also um, epidemiology. But exactly these skills may also probably make a potential GM terrorist, concluding that both micro and human biology are complex interacting systems that have evolved over a long period of time and that the most effective bioterror agents is most probably already out there somewhere. And it's not straightforward or as easy as one might believe, to make something that really works. Um, I mean, my own career as a bioterrorist was actually a flop, I think. Uh, a friend of mine, was, he was going to write a book, uh, a novel on bioterrorism, and he had decided on using the Yashinia pestis as the agent, uh, but he wanted something which was really deadly and it should also be able to spread efficiently. So he had a wonderful plot. Uh, I think the villain here was in Kazakhstan during uh, uh, Yersinia pestis uh, outbreak and brought something home. And so I figure out, okay, to help spreading, we should clone the gene of the pertussis toxin into this Yersinia. So then it could maybe spread by whooping cough. And this was a success in, in the book. It worked wonderful. But after the book was published, uh, I realized that uh, the incubation time for Pertussis is much shorter than the time it takes before you start to cough. So
So, I mean, dead people don't <laughs> cough. They would be dead already. So, even, even if you know microbiology or immunology, it's not that easy. Okay. It's a very good book in spite of that. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I just helped him a little bit then. Yes, it's a good book. Uh, well, now, this has been sa said before, but uh, since the terrorism is based on fear for danger and not the danger in, it, in, in itself, so the, the goal of the terrorists is not to kill as many people as, as possible, rather than performing a sp maybe spectacular attack, demonstrating what, what they are capable of. So the lack of dissemination properties uh, in the listed uh, uh, bioterror agents maybe may be accounted for uh, by the fear they, they would spread in, in the population even by a limited outbreak. So maybe the exception of some obvious and, and straightforward ways to the terrorist goal. I should not go into detail because it's so easy. <laughs> so I shouldn't spread that. So therefore we think, which, which uh, argues against uh, is happening in normal labs. I think that it, just uh, possessing the necessary competence will probably reduce the likelihood of trying to produce an efficient GM terror agent. I think you, you will find the best ones out there. They're already made. Uh, okay, that, that is given you have all the competence you need to realize that. So, beside no, the efforts in the local biosecurity area and international regulations, agreements and protocols, they are gradually contributing to um, limit unauthorized shipping of so-called dual-use items, uh, among them pathogens and nucleic, nucleic acids. However, uh, although it's now, continuously um, being more difficult to get hold of these biologicals and genetic materials, the regulations and international protocols do not yet represent a substantial hindrance uh, when it comes to uh, achieve this, uh, this biochemicals. I actually like a page here. So, okay. It looks different here. <laughs> uh, okay. The last one is, uh, I mean, people who are not uh, working with uh, bioterrorism in, in, in mind, they can, for several reasons, decide um, to make or inflict as much damage as possible on a population and maybe they will go for um, uh, doing it by gene technology and these people will then have uh, the competence they need and they will be able to get uh, the resources and maybe furnish a, a laboratory, efficient laboratory and work alone. And I think these people would be very hard to find, and, and unless you have some uh, concerned citizen or something reporting it to, to the authorities. Uh, and it would take, I mean, to, to detect uh, this would take a lot of uh, dedicated surveillance. I think. So, I think that, or we think that competent individuals with another agenda than bioterror, or maybe also bioterror, 
uh, and possessing private facilities and resources will be difficult to disclose unless dedicated surveillance is implemented. So I think that, uh, as has been said earlier, that this black swan, I mean, we have usually what you have prepared for, or the, it's always the le least uh, thinkable uh, thing that, uh, that happens. Actually, I think that's the things that you never even thought about that will happen. And when I'm talking about surveillance, it seems to become more or less futile in these situations. And it puts a rather heavy responsibility on uh, the preparedness planning to avoid things like, or when it has already happened. So preparedness plans. First and foremost. Okay, I think that's what we have from, or based on all the, the inspections we have done, seeing the labs around how they function, and it's continuously improving. So, okay, thank you.